Okay, everyone, we're about to get started here, and it's my pleasure to welcome you. My name is Maureen Biggers, and I direct the IE Center of Excellence for Women in Technology, and we are co-hosting this event, this one speaker, and we're so delighted to have Lori with us. Um, uh, she brings all kinds of wonderful expertise to the table that we'll hear about in, in a few minutes. A little bit about her, but she's going to actually tell her story mostly, so I just want to give some highlights. It would take a long time to read everything that she can bring to us, so she's going to just tell us and we can read it. Um, but Lori is a professor in both departments, two different departments at Carnegie Mellon, as you probably know, the um, computer science department, and also um, engineering and public policy, and she also is the associate chair for master's program for that department, too. She is the director of the Scilab Usable Privacy and Security Laboratory, which you see up here is otherwise known as PUPS. Uh, she has done so many different things. She was the um, chief technologist for the U.S. Federal Trade Commission in 2016. She co-founded Wombat Security Technologies, which was um, security awareness training. She's authored over 150 different research papers. Um, and I had a great breakfast with her this morning. I learned that she's the mother of three children from middle school to junior and high school. She plays the flute. And as a family, they actually have a rock and roll band. All three kids are aspiring science scientists and rock and rollers. So without saying any more, I'll turn it right over to Lori. <laughs> I'm really delighted to be here today. And um, I was trying to figure out you know, what I should talk about. And I, I said, well, you know, should I talk about women in technology or should I talk about my research? And, and I think I rattled off a bunch of possible research topics I could talk about. And of course, the answer I got back was yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I have endeavored to try to put this all together in a coherent talk that doesn't ramble all over the place, um, but it probably will ramble a bit. So, so bear with me, buckle your seatbelt, um, and hopefully uh, this will be enlightening. So I'm going to start by talking about my personal journey. Um, and this is a journey as uh, a professional woman in technology and as eventually an accidental computer science professor. So I've been really fortunate to have some great female role models. Um, my, my grandma Gertie uh, was a CPA, and my grandma Gladys has a PhD, and she was director of foreign language for the New York City Public Schools, and still actually does some uh, foreign language consulting in her 90s. Um, and my mother uh, started her career as a community college math professor and became a department head and dean and retired a couple years ago as provost of a very large community college. So uh, with all of these uh, female role models around me, I grew up believing that girls could do anything they wanted to do because I had all these examples of women who, who were doing what they wanted to do. Uh, I also observed a number of women um, who I saw in, in the media uh, as I was growing up. Um, so it was really exciting to see Sally Ride, the first American woman in space, and Sandra Day O'Connor, the first woman appointed to the Supreme Court. Um, and I had hoped we might see the first woman president. It hasn't happened yet, but, but I think it will, and, and hopefully not too long. So I was interested in math, science, and computers from a young age, and my parents did their best to encourage uh, those interests uh, from, from the very beginning. Um, my father uh, started his career in the Navy at Bethesda Naval Hospital, and uh, he uh, was a biomedical engineer and had a lot of research computers in his lab. And on no school days, I would go into his lab and uh, he would let me use his research computers and I tried to program them to do things like play tic-tac-toe. Uh, so that, that was a lot of fun. And then my elementary school got, got our first computer, the Commodore PET. It had a, a, tape, a cassette tape player that's where you stored your programs. And um, none of the teachers knew how to use it. 
I, I'm not even entirely sure why we got it because there were there were no adults in the building who knew how to use the computer, and uh, they they knew that my dad did something with computers, so they asked him uh, if he could you know, show them how to do it, and he showed me how to use it. And then I spent my lunch and recess, like for months, like sitting in the school office with this computer, trying to figure out how to do something useful. But besides technology, I was also always very interested in art and uh, all different kinds of art. And I would always volunteer to design like the program covers or the school directory cover. And um, I did, um, uh, you know, weaving and knitting and macrame and all, all sorts of different uh, crafts. So I really enjoyed that. And for a while, I thought maybe I would go into architecture because I thought, well, there's there's like art and drawing involved and there's some engineering involved and it kind of combines things. Um, and then in high school, I had a really amazing opportunity to uh, participate in a magnet program, a science math, computer science magnet program. Um, at Montgomery Blair High School. I was actually in the first graduating class of that program. Uh, there were not actually very many girls in the program, um, but it was, uh, it was really uh, amazing to be in classes with students who were so interested in these STEM fields. And the, uh, the, the magnet program included computer science courses that we all had to take. And I remember doing pretty well in those classes. I took AP computer science, but I never really liked computer science. And one of the reasons I think that I didn't really like computer science is that uh, back then to do your computer science homework, you, you pretty much had to go to the computer lab to do it. And so I would go after school to the computer lab and often I would look around and see I was the only girl in the computer lab. And I was busy. I had marching band, and I worked for the school newspaper. And so I was like, let me get my computer science homework done so I can go to band practice or go write this article. And there were all these guys in the room who they brought their Coke and Doritos, and they were planning on camping out there all afternoon. And I was like, these are not my people. Um, and, I, um, and I kind of associated, if you're going to be a computer scientist, like, you have to like that sort of thing, uh, which wasn't what I was into. Um, I also viewed that computer science was just sitting in front of a computer and typing code, which also wasn't really what I was into. Um, and so I really ruled out the idea of being a computer scientist. This wasn't what I wanted to do. And I thought it was great that I did well on the AP computer science test because I was just going to go be a mechanical engineer. And most mechanical engineering programs require you to take one computer science class, and I get my AP credit. I never need to take another computer science class again in my life. That was, that was my plan. So I went off to Washington University in St. Louis. So we have an alumni here. Go Bears. All right. Um, <laughs> and uh, so WashU is a great school. And um, I marched in there with my computer science AP test score. And they said, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> we don't do that. <laughs> um, and, <laughs> and they said, but, but it's not a problem. If you think you're really so great in computer science, you can take our placement test. And I did. And they said, oh, you did fantastic. You placed out of two undergraduate computer science classes. I was like, great, I'm done. And he said, oh, no, 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 no. This is a placement test. That means you now get to take the third class in our sequence. And I said, but, but I, I, already, I only need one, and you said I placed out a two. And they said, no, no, we're not going to give you credit for those two unless you take two more. You know, <laughs> every course you, you place out of, you have to take another one to get credit for it. So I could either go like retake the intro class, or I could then take the next two classes, which is what I did. And so then I had credit for four computer science classes. And they said, you know, if you take one more, you could get a minor. <laughs> so of course I did. Um, and the whole time I'm like, I don't want to be a computer scientist. No, I really don't like this. I'm only doing this because I have to. Um, by the time I finished the fifth computer science course, I was like, hey, you know, I still don't want to be a computer scientist, but it's actually not so bad. And I see that computer scientists actually do a lot of different kinds of things, just looking a little bit more interesting. Um, so uh, I, I also uh, decided at that point I didn't want to be a mechanical engineer either. 
Um, and uh, at WashU, they had a really unique um, undergraduate major called engineering and policy. And that was very attractive to me because it was very interdisciplinary. And it combined the engineering with more of a policy analysis, which I was also really interested in. Uh, so I decided to be an engineering and policy major and to focus on internet policy. Uh, a lot of students were focusing on environmental policy. Um, that, that was like, a more popular thing to do. And then um, after I graduated, I decided um, to, to uh, stay for another year. I actually graduated in three years, and I didn't really know what I was going to do next. So they said, stay for another year, get a master's. And so I got a master's in technology and human affairs um, and did a thesis uh, focusing on electronic newspapers. Um, and then after that, um, oh, I guess the summer after that, I, um, I decided to spend the summer in Washington, DC. Um, there's a program called Washington Internships for Students of Engineering, WISE, uh, which was a great, great uh, experience um, spending all summer uh, looking at technology policy issues in DC. And um, then uh, I was done with that. I, I went back to WashU and decided to enroll in the PhD program. And they gave me a fellowship. And um, I thought that, that was pretty good. So um, for my uh, doctoral work, I focused on electronic voting. This was back in 1990s, and nobody was talking about electronic voting back then. Yeah, I would tell people, oh, I'm doing my thesis on electronic voting. And they go, electronic what? <laughs> um, so, uh, so that was fun. And I was looking at both um, the technical side. I implemented um, census with a cryptographic electronic voting system. But I was also, um, my, my real interest was actually really on the policy side and um, some of the kind of the decision science uh, side of, of voting. Um, so uh, I was working on that and it seemed to be going well. And then the engineering and public policy department fell apart. And they, um, they cut my, my PhD fellowship because they didn't have any money. Um, and uh, so uh, this was kind of a shock. And, um, and by that point, I knew a lot of computer science faculty because I'd been taking classes there. And they said, well, why don't you just switch and join computer science? And, um, and I said, no, no, I told you all along. I don't want to be a computer scientist. I'm not going to do that. Um, and so, but I was kind of in a bind here. And so they offered me a deal I really couldn't refuse. Um, so uh, one of the reasons that they wanted me to switch, it turns out, is that they needed a head TA. So they said, we want you to be the head TA for the computer science department, um, and we're willing to pay your PhD in engineering and public policy if you'll be the head TA for the computer science department. But how would it look for our head TA to not even be a student in the computer science department? So we want you to get a second master's degree in computer science. And if you do that, we'll pay for your PhD. So this was really a deal that I, I could not pass up. Um, so, so I did that. Um, it turns out actually having a master's degree in computer science has actually served me very well. Um, so no regrets there. But that was not at all um, my intention. Okay, so another thing that happened while I was in grad school is you know, I'm working on my thesis and it's going okay, but you know, after a while you feel like I'm not really making any progress, no tangible progress. I need to do something that I can see and touch where I see progress. And um, uh, by that point, towards the end, I, I had gotten married. And, um, and I told my husband, like, I think I'm going to take up oil painting again. Like, I, I used to do this in, in like, junior high, and it was fun. And, and he said something like, um, could you try some type of art that's not so messy and smelly? Because um, he doesn't live in a small apartment, right? And, and I was like, oh, OK, uh, I'll try quilting instead. I, I, I actually don't know why I said that. I had never quilted in my life, but I did know how to sew. My mom had taught me how to sew, and, um, and I'd always liked looking at quilts. So I bought a quilting book and a bunch of fabric, and I taught myself how to quilt. Um, and I really liked it. Um, in grad school, I only made very small quilts because I didn't have a sewing machine. But when I graduated, the first thing I did was buy a sewing machine and make big quilts. And this quilt is, is actually bigger in real life than you see it projected on this, this screen. That, that was one of my first big quilts that, that I made. And I still make quilts. All right, so after I got um, my PhD in um, engineering and public policy with two master's degrees, one in computer science, um, I thought, well, I'm going to go off and be a professor. 
and I sent out my resume to lots of places, and I said, I want to do interdisciplinary stuff. Um, and, uh, well, I mean, there wasn't a huge market for it. Uh, I actually interviewed here. I got an offer here, um, but, but uh, the offer was not to do interdisciplinary stuff. As I recall, it was like to teach whatever your CS 101 <laughs> class is and, and whatnot. And I was like, well, that's a nice offer, but that's not what I want to do. Um, and then uh, I heard that AT&T Labs was starting a public policy research department. That was kind of interesting. Um, so that's the old Bell Labs, but it become AT&T Labs. And so I emailed them and I said, I heard you're starting this. I don't know what it is, but I am going to graduate soon with a PhD in engineering and public policy. And they said, oh, can you come interview next week? Uh, and I, I went for the interview and they actually offered me the job on the spot because um, they didn't know what it was either, but they were like, wait, this seems to be a really good match. <laughs> so I went, went off to uh, New Jersey um, which was not a state that I had planned to move to at all. Um, and, uh, and I had not planned to work for a company. I planned to go to academia, but you know, things, things don't always work out the way you plan. So uh, I, I went off there. And um, one of the really fantastic things about working for at and Labs at the time was they had a lot of money and a lot of freedom. And so they would tell you, just think great thoughts and do great things. And there, nobody ever assigned you any work to do. Um, in fact, when I came in, they specifically told me, don't do any work for your six, first six months here. <laughs> just go to seminars, read papers, think about good research projects. You know, in about six months, you'll figure out what you want to do. And then, then you can start doing some research. Um, of course, anybody who's a researcher and is trained to be a researcher cannot cannot help themselves. You cannot sit around for six months and not do research. It doesn't work. Um, so, uh, you know, I lasted about six weeks. Um, and, uh, and then I, I was sharing an office at the time because the one thing they didn't have was office space. Um, we, we eventually, they was actually before we moved to this building where we had space. Um, but we were at the old Bell Labs building in Murray Hill. And uh, so I was sharing an office with Paul Resnick um, as well as, as somebody else. Uh, but Paul had been asked to uh, work with the W3C on a new internet privacy standard uh, because Paul had been doing some other standards work with the, with the W3C. And he was like, I've had enough of standards. You're sitting around not doing anything. Why don't you go to this meeting? And the meeting was in Washington. And I was like, oh, I like Washington. And oh, my first business trip. Yay. Um, and so... <laughs> Off I went to this uh, the standards meeting in Washington. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. And it turns out this was not like a technical standard to start with. This was a bunch of lawyers and policy people in a room, and they were looking for an engineer to build them a privacy standard. And I showed up, and they said, you're an engineer. Can you make us a privacy standard? And the thing was, I knew very little about privacy or standards, but... I was like, sure. <laughs> so um, I, I mean, I knew a little bit. I'd been studying internet policy, and privacy was something that came up. But I, I had uh, I'd been teaching an undergraduate computers and society class, so I had a couple lectures on privacy. That, that's pretty much what I knew. Um, so anyway, I, I agreed to, to work on this. And um, uh, I thought, you know, this is a few months. Uh, this will be fun. Uh, what I didn't realize is that I would spend the next seven years working on this. Um, and uh, I also re uh, re realized quickly is I needed to become an expert in privacy. Uh, and there were some, some patient law professors who um, got me up to speed very quickly on, on privacy. Uh, they, you know, they sent me to these international meetings where everybody had to put on the headsets because there was simultaneous translation. And I'm sitting there going, I'm not trained in international diplomacy. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing here. But, but I did it, it worked out, um, and it was pretty cool. So the standard was called P3P, Platform for Privacy Preferences. And the idea behind this standard is that it's uh, an XML language for privacy policies. And so websites can uh, convey their privacy policies in this computer readable language. Um, and now, um, instead of humans having to read these long privacy policies, which nobody reads, uh, your computer and more specifically, your web browser can read it for you and, um, and then do something useful uh, for you. So uh, 
as I said, it, it took about seven years to actually develop this standard, and it was finally uh, released by W3C with great hoopla. And, um, and I wrote a book about it for O'Reilly. Um, and uh, towards the end of that process, I realized that in order for P3P to be useful, there had to be P3P user agent tools that users would want to actually use. And the original idea was that all the web browser vendors would build it into their browsers. Um, but you know, when you have a seven year process, by the time you get to the end of it, some of the people who were involved in the beginning have like packed up their toys and gone home. And so by the end, there was like not much enthusiasm to build it. And the one um, uh, browser vendor that was still at the table and interested was Microsoft. And Microsoft said, yeah, well, uh, we don't really have a lot of resources and um, to, in order to do this, our priorities are elsewhere. You know, we're gonna do it because Bill Gates said we had to, but that doesn't mean we're gonna do much with it. And as far as like user testing, like we don't really want to be biasing people about, you know, privacy is very politicized. Like, so they're like, we're, we're just going to, you know, sort of cut and paste from the standard all the messages that we're going to show users. And I was like, no, 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 that, those, those messages, you know, the standard has stuff for lawyers and for engineers, not for users. Like, this is terrible. Um, and so I went to um, my boss at at and and I said, like, we need to build a P3P user agent that's going to be usable. And, um, and and you know we could do it as a browser plugin. We don't we don't own a browser, but we could do a browser plugin. And AT and T had a uh, an ISP, AT and T WorldNet, so we could build a plugin. We could give it to our WorldNet customers. There's actually a business reason why this might make sense to do. Um, and they said great, and they actually gave me some um, uh, software development resources to work on this. Um, and uh, we developed this thing called Privacy Bird, something like this. Um, and uh, as we started working on Privacy Bird, and basically I was the, the architect and designer for it, um, of course I realized that I, I also was in over my head again. I had no idea what I was doing. I had never done any user interface design. I did take the one HCI class that WashU offered when I was a grad student. I did well in it. Um, <laughs> that's pretty much all I knew about human computer interaction. Um, and so uh, AT&T had, had some really super HCI people back then. And I go down the hall of them and I was like, um, teach me about building uh, HCI for security and privacy. And they were they're like, um, well, we can teach you about HCI, but we don't know anything about security and privacy. And I, I did a literature review and there's like nothing on HCI for privacy. And HCI for security, there, there were like two papers um, that had been written back then. Uh, so this was, you know, this, this whole idea of HCI meets security and privacy was, was just um, not happening. And so I realized <clears throat> there's a need for this. Like w people should be looking at this. Uh, and so that became my inspiration for like, this is a research area that I want to get into. So around that time, AT&T was like laying off lots of people and uh, the telecom industry as a whole wasn't doing very well. And I thought, well, I think it's time to get out of this and go back to academia where I hope to be all along. And you know, when you go do academic job talks, you have to have your research vision and everything. So I said, well, my research vision is to do research in usable privacy and security. And um, I didn't fully know what it, what, what it was yet, but I made up something that sounded pretty compelling. Uh, and I got a job at Carnegie Mellon. So um, I went off to Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh, School of Computer Science. Actually, when I started there, this building was not there, but it got built after that. Uh, but that, that's our main computer science uh, building, that's our Gates building. Um, and I became a computer science professor. And uh, it was it was really funny to me anyway. I was like, wait, how did this happen? How do I become a computer science professor? Um, and and I think the people around me were all like, there's kind of an obvious path of how you became a computer science professor. But to me, it was very surprising. Like I that this was not at all how I expected things to turn out. I'm really happy about it, but but th this was not the path I had planned. Uh, so I actually uh, really like being a computer science professor at CMU. And actually, after I joined, I then got the joint appointment with engineering and public policy. I, I didn't actually start there, um, but I'm now 50-50, uh, and I'm now um, associate department head of EPT. Um, 
but uh, it, it's really fun. And I have found a lot of really great uh, colleagues and students to work with. So this picture is actually about five years old now, I think. Um, but uh, you can see, you know, these are not all my students. Like, there's also faculty and, and other people's students. There is this growing group of people at CNU who are interested in digital privacy and security. Um, and so we, we have kind of, you know, this critical mass there, which, which has been really fun. Um, and I think, I think uh, arguably, we, we have the largest, um, you know, usable privacy and security group <laughs> anywhere, um, certainly in the U.S. Uh, and our group is very interdisciplinary, so we have uh, students and faculty in computer science, but we also have people in economics and public policy and psychology and other areas of the university uh, that, that we've been collaborating with as well. Okay, so um, why do we need a special group focused on usable privacy and security? Isn't this just you know, a branch of HCI or something? And by the way, CMU has an entire department called the Human Computer Interaction Institute. Um, we, we have a school of computer science and we have seven departments. And there's one that is uh, Human Computer Interaction. I'm not actually in that department, although I do have an affiliate appointment and um, my class, some of my classes are cross-listed there. But why, why do we need you know, this special focus? Um, so uh, this is something that, that you know, people often ask me and I've been thinking about. And when you're doing user studies focused on security and privacy, uh, one thing about them that's a bit different than, um, than when you're doing other types of, of user studies is that we often have the, the, the presence of an adversary or some sort of a risk. Um, and, uh, and sometimes it's, it's actually simulated. Uh, because we usually can't um, hurt users by exposing them to real risk. Um, and, and one way to think about it is, you know, imagine you were doing a user study testing a word processor. And so you might uh, ask people to try you know, changing the color of the text and the font, maybe insert a table, spell check. Right. Um, so you, you can imagine that's a pretty straightforward user study to design. Um, but if this were a usable security study, you would actually have someone deleting all the user's text as they typed it. Um, and the user would have to figure out <laughs> how, to, how to proceed anyway. Uh, so this is, this is kind of how usable security studies um, tend to go. Right, so there's a few different strategies that we use so that we can observe users in the presence of risk. Um, and I'm going to talk about three types of strategies that we use. Um, so the first strategy is we, um, when possible, we observe users doing their real activities where there's whatever risk is actually there. We're not adding any risk. It's whatever risk is there. We observe it and um, we see what happens. We see how they respond to the risk. We see, we see what tools they're using, what tools they're not using, what errors they're making and whatnot. Um, and this, this is uh, a great approach and we've done a number of studies using this approach. Uh, however, it's not always possible to look over people's shoulders or instrument their computer so you can see this. And sometimes some of the activities or behaviors we're looking for are very infrequent. So we'd actually have to follow people for a long period of time to see what we want to see. So another approach is to give people hypothetical security tasks and watch them do those tasks. Um, and so, uh, you know, we may say, uh, you know, install PGP, uh, you know, use, you know, configure Facebook with their privacy settings, or and we will watch them do it. We may give them a hypothetical scenario. It's, it's always um, more realistic if you give people a scenario. So instead of just saying, um, you know, use PGP, you give them a scenario. You are working uh, with this kind of job. Here's a reason why people in this job want to use PGP. Um, so uh, we even often tell them, this is your name, this is your office, right? To get them really have their mindset focused on this, and then we can see how they use uh, the particular software. Um, now, in order to uh, you know, get risk into the picture, part of the scenario is we tell them why, why they should worry about risk. So you know, we tell them who's trying to intercept their email or, or whatnot. Okay. And then the third approach is to be a bit deceptive, usually. And we give them a non-security task so that they're not thinking about security at all. 
And then we simulate some kind of security risk so that we can see how they respond to that. Um, so we tell them that the study is about online shopping. And in the middle of their actual purchases on, say, Amazon.com, we uh, send them a phishing message. Right? And then we can see how they respond. Right, so one of the earliest studies uh, that I did at CMU was a continuation of the Privacy Bird work from AT&T. So we took uh, Privacy Bird and we put it into a web browser, and it was Privacy Finder. And the idea was when you did your web search, you would see a privacy meter on the side that would tell you, it would evaluate the, the website's privacy policy. Um, that's assuming the website had P3P on the site. Um, so we built um, a kind of a shopping search engine here where you would see the privacy and then you would see the price of the item uh, on the other side. And we wondered, um, if we do this, will this actually change people's purchasing behavior? You know, do they care enough about privacy that they would actually shop at the places that have better privacy? Um, around the time this was kind of controversial, that uh, there were industry people going around um, lobbying, you know, we don't need privacy laws. You know, if people care about privacy, they do something, but most people don't care, it doesn't matter. Right? And so we're like, well, maybe the problem is that they just don't read the privacy policies because it's too hard and they can't figure out where the good privacy is. So let's make it really easy and show them where the good privacy is while they act on it. So we thought about the different ways we could do it. And we thought, well, we're going to have to do a hypothetical task here. We're going to have to you know, ask people to search for a product and then, and then uh, ask them, you know, which site are you going to buy from? Um, and you know, the problem is that there's no real privacy trade-off. Like, I can tell you I'm going to buy from the site that's most expensive and has the best privacy policy. But you know, <clears throat> I have nothing to lose by telling you that, because you're not actually asking me to spend my money. And on the other hand, I'm not making the purchase, so my privacy isn't really at risk anyway. Um, so uh, we thought, all right, maybe we can make it more real. And, um, and thanks to um, my colleague, Alessandro Quisti, who's an economist. And economists always want to make it real. And he's like, this would never get published in an economics journal unless you make it real. Um, and that was like such useful advice. Um, so then we said, all right, how can we make this real? And I remember um, we were all like sitting on the lawn outside brainstorming what could we have people purchase that we could afford <laughs> to do this study? Because like, we have to pay them to do this. Um, and we were like, trying to figure out what would we do. We want people to purchase with their own credit card. Um, and then it was like, oh, and then they're going to go to like random websites, and they're all going to have different prices, and how are we going to control this? Um, but we came up with an idea of how to do it, and we, we did a study. And um, our first study had, had a great title. Power strips, prophylactics, and privacy, oh my. <laughs> um, and I think it actually got accepted um, mostly because it had such a great title. Um, there were a lot of problems with the study. It was a public study, but it had a lot of problems. Um, so one problem is we did the study with Carnegie Mellon students. So everybody's a student in the study, not a very uh, representative sample in any way. Um, we reimbursed everybody for their purchases, which in hindsight, they still were not really incentivized, but they could have you know, purchased the most expensive product they wanted and we would have still reimbursed them. Um, we also gave them an interface where they would see the price of the items, but not the shipping costs. And so some people were actually going and checking the shipping price and adding it in and other people weren't. So that was kind of inconsistent. Um, we also realized we were testing what happened when people use our search engine and when they use not our search engine, um, and and what we what we showed was when without our privacy meters, people just purchase at the cheapest place. But with our privacy meters, they were more likely to purchase um, at the better privacy. But we didn't really know if it was because it was better privacy or just like oh, there's a cool meter here. Like, yeah, I want that. I don't know what it is, but I want it. Um, and then we also had to choose a privacy sensitive item to have them purchase. And my students decided we should have them purchase condoms, um, uh, mostly because they're cheap. Um, but, it, but you remember we had college students as our audience. And then afterwards, we're like, yeah, college students purchase condoms all the time. It's no big deal. So maybe it's not like all that privacy sensitive. All right, so then we did the study again. 
And this time we recruited uh, Pittsburgh residents. We put up signs and bus stops and advertised around the city. So we did not have um, a lot of students in our study. And we redesigned the interface so there was a clear uh, price privacy trade-off. We gave everybody a fixed payment and told them they could keep the change. So that way they had an incentive to buy the cheaper items because they would have more, um, more money they would get back. Um, and uh, we, we spent a lot of time thinking about um, what icons, what products, what conditions. So I'm going to show you some of this. All right, so we did a free study where we basically said to people, imagine you're doing a uh, study at Carnegie Mellon and you're asked to make a purchase. Uh, how comfortable would you be if you're asked to buy textbooks? Okay. How comfortable would you be if you're asked to buy office supplies? Right? And then we asked them about um, uh, cigarettes, sex toys, porn DVDs, bullets. Right? Um, and what you can see here is at the top, these are things that people said they would purchase with either no concern or just a few concerns. And down here, this is the stuff where they're like, I would run fleeing from the lab if you asked me to do that. No way. Um, and so what we wanted was something in the sweet spot where people would say, yes, I would actually purchase that, but I'd have a lot of concerns in doing it. Um, and we chose, we wanted a privacy sensitive item and a non privacy sensitive item. So we, choose, we chose two categories. So non privacy sensitive office supplies and privacy sensitive, we chose sex toys, um, largely because they come in a variety of price ranges and we could find something inexpensive that was also available on lots of websites. So this is actually what, what we uh, chose. We told people they had to use their credit cards, um, but uh, if they didn't want to send to their home, they could actually send it to our lab instead. And a lot of people did. Um, so our, our office supply was, uh, was definitely batteries. And then we had these uh, Pocket Rocket Junior sex toys that we developed a large collection of. <laughs> but get batteries. <laughs> the, 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 the batteries did not fit them. Oh. Yeah, everybody <laughs> asked about that. They took a different kind of battery. All right, so um, we we also um, needed to choose carefully which merchants we would have in our study. So what we're doing, we set up this, this web page with an internet search, but we actually, the thing that we were faking here was that we actually pre-populated what the search results would be. It was not actually going out to Google and, and running the search. And so we set it up so that the first four hits, which nobody looks beyond the first four hits of a search. So the first four hits were very carefully controlled. So the first hit, was to a website that had a really good price and would have no privacy score. It's a question mark. The next one would have a, um, a slightly more expensive price and would have a bad privacy policy. The third one would have a more expensive price and would have a medium privacy policy. And the fourth one would have the most expensive price and a great privacy policy. Um, and so our thought was, if they don't care about privacy, they're going to go to with the first hit on the page, because most people do that, and the cheapest, which is the same thing. And so now there's two barriers they have to overcome. If they, uh, if they go down to this fourth one, they're scrolling down, and they're paying more money. So they, that shows they must really want the privacy. Oh, and I should add that the... Um, Um, all right, so uh, the difference in price between the most expensive and the least expensive here uh, was usually 69 cents. And I say usually because these were real websites and they were changing their prices. Um, and the other problem we had was that the sex toy um, was actually a bigger difference in price. So uh, this is what it looked like to our participants. We had some people in a privacy condition where they would see these um, privacy meters, and there was a link to a privacy report, um, which hardly anybody ever clicked on, but it was there. And then we had what we called our irrelevant information condition. And here, we, um, it was exactly the same, except it said handicapped accessibility. And we did a pre-study to show that um, people who were not handicapped did not care about handicapped accessibility when buying um, you know, <laughs> items on websites. And then we had the no information condition, did not have any meters. 
Um, and what did we find? The privacy icons did actually influence the purchases. Um, so we found what we expected as far as um, with without the privacy icons or with the handicapped accessibility, people just purchased from the least expensive website. We add the privacy meters there, then people, not everybody, but a lot of people were influenced to pay more for privacy. So this is really the first study that showed um, uh, that people actually value privacy to a point that they, they might pay for it. Um, but we expected to see a bigger effect for the um, sex toy condition, the battery condition, and we didn't see that. And so we wondered if it was because we hadn't properly controlled for the prices. Uh, so we did it again. Um, and this time, my, my poor student called 46 battery and sex toy vendors, um, trying to find eight of them that would set their prices exactly where we needed them to set that so that we could have um, a controlled study. And most of them, um, they actually raised their prices by like five cents or something. Um, but there was one that we needed them to lower their price. And so my student told them, well, we'll pay you for your lost sales. Um, and so in the end, we owed the dirty bunny $140. <laughs> and I did get Carnegie Mellon to cut a check to the dirty bunny uh, for research project assistance. <laughs> Um, and sure enough, we found that once we controlled for this, we were able to see the effect that we had predicted. So that was pretty cool. All right. um, another uh, related project we looked at um, was, uh, was making privacy policies more useful. Now, remember I said that the idea with P3P was so that you didn't have to actually read privacy policies. Um, but sadly, P3P never really saw widespread adoption. Privacy Bird and Privacy Finder are not available for people to use. Uh, so um, short of that, we said, okay, well, what can we do to get human readable privacy policies more useful? And uh, we came up with this idea of developing a privacy nutrition label that would have some of the good features of food nutrition labels that makes it very easily learnable and comparable and short. And so we, we did an iterative design process. Uh, we started out the first version looked very much like a nutrition label. And then we made, went through more of a table and we added color and we ended up with something like this. Um, and we did extensive testing of that. But now we have the problem of not just um, website privacy policies, but IoT devices, right? Um, interesting that the IoT devices here well, there were more on the slide before. <laughs> All right, anyway, uh, imagine other IoT devices, uh, you know, smart light bulbs and, uh, and, and other types of devices, but there are lots of IoT devices in our environment. And um, are you gonna walk into a room and um, you know, go up to the light bulbs and, and you know, the video camera, the service that way, do you have a privacy policy? Is there a privacy? Oh, there it is! <laughs> like, nobody's gonna do that. Uh, and so we wondered, well, how can we actually communicate with consumers about privacy in an IoT environment? And um, we came up with this idea of a personal privacy assistant. The idea here with a personal privacy assistant is that the, it, it's a piece of software that can live in your smartwatch or your smartphone, and it can look for privacy policies for you. Uh, in order to make that happen, the IoT devices need to broadcast their privacy policies, preferably in a computer-readable format. And then your privacy assistant can be listening, and now I walk into the room and the privacy assistant is like, okay, there's 29 light bulbs in here and two thermostats and a video camera. All right, 29 light bulbs, no problem. They're just present sensors. They're actually not recording any, anything identifiable. But that video camera, that's a problem. Right? And so it will interrupt me only for things that I've set it up to say I want to be interrupted about. Um, and even better would be if there was a way for it to signal to that video camera that it should shut off or blur my face or something like that. Another project that we worked on, and this also goes way back, um, uh, was uh, the problem of fishing and uh, how to actually help people help themselves and protect themselves from fishing. So uh, one of my students developed this video game called Anti-Fishing Phil. And this was inspired by some studies we started with where we tried to understand how were experts protecting themselves 
And experts, when we talk to them, they would say, well, I mouse over the URL, and if it looks fishy, I don't click on it. And then we went to lay people, and they were not doing that. And when we said, oh, did you ever try mousing over the URL, they'd say, what's a URL? Um, so, uh, and then if we show them, they, they didn't know how to read or parse a URL. This was not useful to them. So this game basically uh, taught people that you should look at the URL, and it taught them how to look at the URL and how to distinguish a legitimate from a fishy URL. Um, and then we developed another system called FishGuru. And the idea here is that uh, a company could send fake phishing emails to their own employees. And um, if the employee clicked on the link and fell for it, it would pop up uh, a comic strip that explained to them what phishing was and what they could do to protect themselves. Um, and we found this was, both of these were really effective. This was interesting. We, we did a study where we um, just gave people the comic strip and then we tested them. And then we had people who fell for the fish and saw the comic strip. And for the people who we just gave the comic strip, I mean, it's like they didn't read it. Um, but if they thought they had just fallen for a fish, who they actually read it and they paid attention and they learned something from it. So you had a teachable moment there. Um, so this was, was actually uh, pretty effective. Um, we did a number of studies, a number of papers on this, and um, we put the anti-fishing fill game up on our website. And we started getting calls from uh, companies that said, we'd like to license this to train our employees. And, um, and then we realized, wow, that you, know, you can make some money on this or something. Uh, and so we started a company called Wombat Security Technologies uh, to commercialize uh, this and, and develop new things. So this is from a long time ago, about 10 years ago, of um, some of the initial Wombat team. Um, I don't know if any of you saw the news this week. Um, Wombat uh, is now, there's now an agreement for Wombat to be purchased um, by Proofpoint for $225 million. Um, so the deal has not closed yet, but we're, we're very excited about it. All right, so another area that I've done a lot of work in is passwords. Um, and uh, we started off uh, working on passwords because Carnegie Mellon went from basically no password policy to a very onerous password policy. And we looked into why did they do that, and um, they pointed to some NIST guidance. And, um, and we said, well, um, it would be really nice if this was not only secure but also usable. And we wondered how we could do that. And we started reading the NIST guidance, and we found out that NIST actually didn't have any data to base this on. Um, and you know, it, it makes sense they didn't have data. It's hard to get password data. But we said, hey, it's an opportunity. Maybe we can get some password data. So we started looking into where to get password data. Um, and so one, one place to get password data is, is you invite people into your lab, and you ask them to create passwords. Um, and this is very slow. You, you get passwords pretty slowly. Uh, you can do online studies, and you can collect passwords a lot faster. Or you can get real passwords. Um, the easiest way to get passwords is to steal them. Um, we, of course, did not steal them. But other people stole them and published them on the internet, and we took advantage of that. Uh, you can also do surveys. And instead of getting the passwords themselves, you can ask people to tell you about their passwords, like how many characters long they are. Um, or you can get legitimate access to actual passwords. Uh, so we actually did all of these things, including getting access to all of the passwords for Carnegie Mellon students, faculty, and staff in order to do our study. We never actually saw them, but our, our scripts and our, our, uh, our software did. Um, I'm only going to talk a little bit about online studies because it would be a whole other hour to tell you about all the others. So our online studies uh, were done using Amazon Mechanical Turk, <laughs> and this was uh, a great system where we can basically post a, you know, do our five-minute study and we'll pay you $2 or whatever it was we paid. Um, so we recruited people and gave them a hypothetical role-playing scenario. So again, this was to create that simulated risk. And so we asked them to imagine that their main email password had been compromised and they needed to change it. And we randomly assign them to a password policy. So we might tell them, you know, it has to be 16 characters long, or it has to have, you know, a digit, whatever it was. They then took a survey. Like two minutes later, they recalled their password, and we could see how long it took them or how many attempts. And then two days later, we emailed them and asked them to try to enter their password again, and we gave them another survey. 
Uh, so here are some examples of password policies that we tested. Um, so basic eight was you know, any eight characters, or at least eight characters. Dictionary eight is it can't be a dictionary word. Comprehensive eight is eight characters with uppercase, lowercase, digit, and symbol. And basic 16 is at least 16 characters. Um, we tested many, many other policies, but these are just a few examples. Uh, we used a number of different usability metrics here. So we looked at uh, how many attempts it would take to create a password, to recall a password, um, whether people wrote it down. And we asked them questions like, how fun was this? How annoying was this? And then we also had password strength metrics. And so here um, we had metrics including guessability. Um, this was the main one that we ended up using. And this is how many guesses would it take an attacker on average to guess your password? Now, this, of course, depends on the algorithm that the attacker is using to try to guess the password. But we looked at a number of the most sophisticated password guessing approaches we could find, and then we developed some that were even more sophisticated, and we used those um, for our metrics. All right, so this allowed us to make graphs that look something like this. And basically, what you see here is the number of guesses the attacker is going to make, and this is on a log scale, and the percentage of passwords they have guessed at that point. So if you're up here on this red line, that means that they've guessed more than half of your passwords up here. So that's bad. And down here, <laughs> this is the best we could do with this particular set of policies. Um, so the, these are reasonably good um, over here. And so we have, um, we have a blacklist policy, the comprehensive eight, and basic 16 that seem to be pretty good. But that's just based on security. What about usability? So here are some usability results. Um, so this is for uh, how annoying or how difficult it is to create a password. And what we see here, Comprehensive 8 and Basic 16 were really good on strength, but they're also really bad on usability. So they're up here. People are strongly agreeing that creating a password was annoying. Um, so that's bad. But one good thing we see here is that Comprehensive 8 and Basic 16 are not the same. These are actually statistically significantly different. Um, and the same thing over here. And so, in fact, Basic 16 is actually much more usable than Comprehensive 8. So if you're going to choose between those kind of most secure policies, it actually might make sense to pick Basic 16. Um, now, it turns out we found other things that were wrong with Basic 16, so that's not actually what I'm recommending. But um, this just kind of shows you um, the way we approach this. Um, we also got data on the use of symbols and found that there are some symbols that are way more popular than others. Uh, we also looked at password meters for those that actually help. And uh, when we started this test, we're like, well, there are lots of different password meters. Which one do we test? So we decided to test all of them. Um, so we tested big ones and little ones and those that had words and those that didn't have words. And then we even tested this one, which is a dancing bunny. And the dancing bunny dances faster and faster and faster um, as your password gets stronger. Uh, so that was really fun. Uh, uh, and um, so <laughs> what did we find for this study? Um, <laughs> What we found is that it turns out that it doesn't really matter what color, shape, or size, or whether your bunny dances. Um, the password meters do help a little bit. And what we did find was that we could make password meters better by having them kind of withhold praise, you know, don't actually tell you it's good until it, you work a little bit harder, um, and by adding more actionable and useful information, which a lot of password meters, you know, your password could be more secure. <laughs> okay. Um, and then we did some studies um, looking at um, misconceptions people had about passwords to give us some idea of what should we be telling them in the password meter. And so we found that a lot of people think that this is a super cool way of making a password. Keyboard pattern, just go down, go down the keyboard and you make a password and it looks like totally random. Um, except that that's on all of the hacker or like bad password lists. Mm -hmm. Um, we also found that people are so used to hearing that you should add a symbol to your password that they all think you can just add it on the end and it will be fine. And it will be actually, we had people in studies tell us, oh, I just created, you know, I love you. I know that's a bad password. But if I put an exclamation point on the end, now it's secure. It's really wrong. 
Um, all right, so we have developed now an open source password meter based on our work, which not only uses a more accurate notion of what is a strong password than most of them out there do, but we also have actionable advice about how to make your password better. Um, and we have a high paper on that. It, it tested pretty well. Uh, another exciting thing is that NIST got around last summer to updating their guidance. And they cited us a number of times. They took a lot of our advice. They didn't take all of our advice. But we're not entirely happy. But it's a lot better than it used to be. Um, and uh, uh, so that, that, that is a good thing. Um, okay. uh, I also did a TED talk on passwords. And uh, it, it surprisingly ended up as in-flight entertainment on Delta Airlines for a while. <laughs> so, so, you know, I've done my part in helping, you know, spread, spread the word on password security to the world, or at least business travelers. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, will you hold your question? Uh, I want to get through a little bit more. Um, okay, so um, I, uh, as you see, I really like my job. I really like being a computer science professor. Um, but uh, one of the cool perks of being a computer science professor or any professor is you sometimes get to take sabbaticals. And so uh, I wanted to take a sabbatical, but uh, at the time I had three young children and, um, and my husband wasn't too keen on relocating. So I had to try to figure out, you know, what could I do that would be really different and interesting and exciting and mentally liberating and intellectually restorative and relaxing and totally awesome and I could do it in Pittsburgh. So um, I decided I was going to go back and do some art. And I had to convince my dean that this was like somehow relevant to my professional development. And so I told him I would visualize privacy and security through art. Um, and uh, that's, you know, this, this is pretty much all I wrote and uh, I approved my sabbatical. <laughs> so I went over to the art school at Carnegie Mellon, and uh, and I, I hung out there for a year. Uh, this is my sewing machine and all my fabric piles and junk there. Um, and I made a lot of quilts, and I made a lot of pretty quilts. And then I was like, oh yeah, I'm supposed to do privacy and security through art, right? So then I did some privacy quilts. Um, this one is on de-identification. Um, you, you can't tell what it is, right? If you stare at it long enough, you will. It re-identifies. Um, and then this was a self-portrait. Um, uh, that year, I also dyed my hair blue. And it looked exactly like that. But <laughs> privacy, you know, privacy protection. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, and then I wrote some software to uh, design these funky sine wave quilts that were pretty cool. Um, and then um, somebody said, you know, if you're going to make security quilt, obviously you need to make a security blanket. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. Um, what does that look like? And so I thought about the password research, and I did a word cloud of a, uh, of a password breach. And, um, and these are weighted based on the frequency in the data set. And then I manually went through and classified, uh, these are a 1,000 passwords. Um, into various buckets that were loose topical grouping. So you can see all the numbers, um, digits are in blue, and, um, and there's girls' names in pink, and there's uh, animals in gray, and there's some profanity and kind of a gold color if you look carefully inside. Um, so, so that was pretty cool. Um, and uh, in the process of doing that, I actually not only did nice art, but I learned about passwords. Um, and so I spent a lot of time thinking, like, why is princess such a popular password? And you know, I have two daughters, and I was like, ah, Disney princesses, right? Um, but then I realized, no, that's probably not it. Um, actually, I, I looked at uh, pet names, dog and cat names, and it turns out princess is popular both for dogs and cats, um, at least in the United States. So that that's my theory. I, I don't know. I can't prove it, but that's my theory. Um, and then, uh, let's see, I love you. Lots and lots of love words. Um, and any word that I saw that I didn't know what it meant, I Googled for it. And usually it was, I love you in like Swahili or something. <laughs> you know, there was a, I love you in lots and lots of languages. Um, so very, very popular. Um, very rarely was it profanity. There's a lot more love than hate in passwords. <laughs> um, there, were, there were animals, of course, and monkey um, is the most popular animal in any list of passwords I've ever seen. And in this particular data set, it's actually the 14th most popular password. And so I was like, this is peculiar. Why? 
terrified. And I kept asking my students, um, you know, why? And and I said, we need to do a study on this. And my students were like, you are bananas. I'm like, no, no, I'm not bananas. Um, so uh, we actually added to one of our studies um, an extra question. So if anybody created a password for our study that had the word monkey in it, we added a question and said, why is there a monkey in your password? And so we, we collected data from like 8,000 people and we caught 17 monkeys. And, um, and, and basically, I mean, it wasn't really for them. We found out people like monkeys. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it is consistent with the other things I observed that people are making passwords about things that they like. Not, um, not things that they hate, <laughs> um, not things that are random, which is what we want them to do, but things that they like. Um, I actually submitted the quilt to a scientific visualization contest, and it was in Science Magazine. So then I was able to go to my dean and say, during my sabbatical, I got a science publication. <laughs> That's the only time I've ever been published in Science Magazine. <laughs> Um, and then there was an art show. My quote was an art show, and I needed a dress to wear to the show, so I made a password dress. Mm -hmm. um, and I did not wear it today because it's too cold outside. <laughs> um, but I, I often, when I'm invited to speak places, people say, oh, and of course you'll wear your password dress. So it has been many places. It has been on TV many times. Um, it's a lot of fun. Another thing I did in the art school was a project called Privacy Illustrated, where we said, um, what does privacy look like? And we went around and asked people to draw pictures of privacy. We started with kindergartners, um, and uh, and then we moved on to adults. Um, and it's interesting, you see similar themes from kindergartners and adults. Potties definitely weigh in. Um, we also see a lot of locks and doors. Um, we see a lot of uh, fences, more locks and doors. Windows, blinds, very popular. Um, people spying, the NSA in particular spying, <laughs> lots of eyeballs. Uh, so we've been collecting these for a few years now. We have about 400 in our collection now, and anybody would like to contribute one, we're happy to accept it. Um, this is one of my favorites. Spider-Man needs privacy to put his costume on. <laughs> um, and, and these I like too. So th these made me think about privacy a little bit differently. Um, so these are both animals that have shells that carry their privacy with them. So you've got your oyster and your turtle. And I thought those were really, really nice metaphors for privacy. All right, and um, after I finished you know, one sabbatical and I was back at CMU for a couple of years, and then I got a call from the Federal Trade Commission. And they said, we'd like you to come to DC for a year or two and be the chief technologist. And um, when I got the call, my first response was, I can't move my family to DC, I can't do this. And um, they called me back a few months later and they said, no, really, we want you to do this. And I said, no, really, I can't relocate to DC. And I said something like, I don't know, if it was part-time or something. And they said, well, it's not part-time. And then they called me back again and they said, would you consider coming to DC, say, three days a week? And I was like, well, okay, we can negotiate this. Um, and so I negotiated both with the chairwoman and with my family, and um, and we worked it out. I, I went to D.C. three days a week. I flew to D.C. every week for a year. Um, that part was not fun, but <laughs> but being in D.C. and working um, with the FTC chairwoman was great. My family stayed in Pittsburgh, but they did sometimes come visit. Um, and uh, here, this is the chairwoman, uh, Edith Ramirez, who was wonderful to work with. And I um, had a lot of great opportunities to understand what goes on in the FTC and their policy making, um, but also uh, to actually do some things that you know made some impact. Um, one of the big projects I worked on, uh, I was very interested in making privacy policies more usable, but I realized that the FTC actually only had limited ability to do that. Um, but the FTC also uh, works with a lot of other consumer disclosures, not just privacy. So I organized a workshop putting disclosures to the test, and we had people who work on nutrition labels and drug facts labels um, and uh, energy labels and all different kinds of consumer disclosures. And we talked about how you make them better and how you test them. And that's the key thing. Um, and people talked about, like, it's just super important to test. Even if you can only do a small test on a low budget, it's better than nothing, and you can at least get rid of the completely bad stuff that way. Um, and the importance of not just saying, 
here's a disclosure, read it and tell me what you don't understand. I mean, that's, that's a good start, but we really need people to use it in context so that they can see um, you know, whether, you know, when, you, when you're trying to make that decision, do you know what to do with this information? All right, um, last thing, I know I have to wrap up. Um, I, um, when I was at the FTC, I had my cell phone hijacked. Um, I didn't even know this was possible. Um, but somebody walked into a phone store with a fake ID and said they were me. And, um, and they said they'd like to upgrade my phones. And they walked out with two brand new iPhones with my phone numbers on them. Um, and uh, I, uh, it, it took a while to figure it out, but I eventually, eventually realized that that's what happened and it was fraud. Um, and so I went through the whole, you know, filing fraud reports. Um, you know, I worked for the FTC, so I walked down the hall and they said, oh, identitytheft.gov, we, we own that, and they should do this. So, so I, I did all that and, and I, I highly recommend it if anything like this happens to you. I did my um, uh, fraud alerts reported it, and I went to my local police station and all of that. And then I discovered that some of my friends had had the same thing happen to them. Like, I'd never heard of this. And then suddenly, like, this is happening to people. Um, so so that, that was weird. And so I said, I wonder how often this happens. And so I started looking for news articles, and you know, I started finding news articles about this, um, mostly local news, very little national media coverage of it, but lots of local news about this. And then international news. So in my case, I think the thief just wanted the phones, you know, new iPhones. But um, internationally, the people were reporting that thief was using this so that they could break into a bank account to get the second factor in a two-factor authentication confirmation. And that's really scary. Um, and so uh, the FTC has data. They have something called the Consumer Sentinel Network. When you report stuff to the FTC, it goes into this database. So I was like, all right, can I get access to this database and find out how often this gets reported? And um, it actually gets reported a lot. I mean, it's a small fraction of identity theft, but um, not insignificant. So I found in January 2013, during that month, there were about 1,000 reports, which made up 3.2% of identity theft reports. Three years later, there's 2,600, which made up over 6% of identity theft reports. So this is not insignificant and it's growing. So then I got in touch with the telephone um, carriers, um, all of the major ones, and said, what are you doing about this? And I work for the FTC, right? You know, and, and they were like, oh, you can put an extra password on your phone, it will help, right? And so you should do that. This is the only, the only advice I give you is, is you should find out if you can have that extra security password. Um, but it's not foolproof. And I know plenty of people who did that and they still had this happen to them. Um, so I think there's a lot more that the, the phone carrier should be doing. Uh, so I wrote a blog post about it. And one of my superpowers at the FTC is that I could write blog posts on the front page of the FTC website. So I did. And um, I got picked up by a lot of media outlets. Um, and then the Today Show showed up and they said, we'd like to have you on tomorrow morning. And I said, this was one of the days I was in Pittsburgh. And they said, oh, no problem. We have a camera crew that's going across the country to a Trump rally or something. And so we'll, we'll swing by in two hours. So in my kitchen, I was on the Today Show, you know, can't even tell what is in my kitchen, right? Um, <laughs> so, um, and then I also found out afterwards, uh, a few weeks later, um, that people were doing this to break into social media accounts. So Duray McKesson has, um, uh, what's, he has a huge amount of 395,000 followers at that point. And somebody broke into his Verizon account so that they could tweet as him. All right. Um, at the FTC, at the time I was there, there were four commissioners. They were all women. It was really cool. Uh, uh, and I should also mention that not only were, were they all women, um, all of the bureau chiefs at the FTC at the time were women and the chief privacy officer and the chief technologist. I had, I had never actually worked in an environment like that. Um, I have, you know, as I said, normally been in environments that are mostly men. But nonetheless, um, I was always the one who persisted to say, I'm going to a conference, I'm bringing my baby, and I'm going to sit here, listen to the talks, and breastfeed. And um, it made people uncomfortable, but I did it anyway. Um, and I encourage other women to do that. Um, I also, when I started at CMU, there were no um, 
uh, lactation rooms or new mother's rooms on campus. I decided I was going to do something about it. I didn't need it. I had a private office, but lots of other women on campus don't have a private office, and I made sure that we took care of that. Um, one of my latest projects at CMU is there, uh, there's a shortage of child care in, in Pittsburgh and around the university. Um, so we started this care-like service where members of the CMU community can advertise if they want to provide services or if um, they want to make use of services. And it's it's not just, it's care-like, it's not just child care, but we also have like pet care and lawn care. And, um, so it's actually now being used by everybody, but it's especially appreciated by um, junior faculty mothers uh, who are having trouble arranging child care. So um, final words I'm going to leave you with is that um, I think, you know, we all need to speak up um, about women in technology and minorities in technology. Um, we need to let people know that harassment and discrimination are not okay. Um, and we need to find ways of supporting each other. Um, we need to make sure that we point out the absence of women and minorities on panels. You know, we shouldn't have manals, mm -hmm. right? And yet, I go to so many conferences where we have panels. You know, they're they're 100% men on panels. Usually, 100% white men on panels. Um, I also go to conferences where, sadly, they have events featuring strippers. Right? We, we really cannot continue to tolerate this sort of thing. Um, we also need to be mentors. These are the people that I mentor right now. Um, these are my current PhD students and um, uh, two staff members and one of my former PhD students. Um, you can see it's a it's a diverse bunch. Uh, if anything, the the, uh, the poor guy in the picture, uh, but he's a good sport about it. Um, so I encourage everybody to uh, to be a mentor, and at all stages, even students can be mentors to, to other students. And I think that that can really help people. And as you all have probably figured out by now, um, I never really had a plan in my career, but it's okay. <laughs> it worked out. I don't think it's important that you start out and say, this is where I want to be 20 years from now, or 10 years, or even five years from now. Um, I think what's important is to be open to opportunities and be open to things that you hadn't expected. And when somebody says to you, well, can you be there three days a week, to not immediately laugh, but to say, well, all right, let me let me think about, is this something that, that we, could, we could get to work? Um, there are lots of directions that you can go in, and being open to opportunity, I found I've ended up all sorts of places that I never expected that I would go. All right, thank you. We have a few moments for questions, if you're willing. Yes. Uh, all right. Well, so you, you mentioned this uh, P3P and yeah. privacy, policies and privacy reports and so on. But to which extent it is enforceable? That is, a company says it's a wonderful privacy policy. We don't uh, give any information to anybody. But actually, they, if they do so, is it only enforceable simply as a contract breach or as a... Yeah, it's enforceable only through legal mechanisms, not... But I mean, it pure, purely as a as a contract breach. That's some kind of administrative violation. Like well, it depends what country you're in. Oh, no. um, if, if you're in the United States, um, it, it is either a contract breach or it is a deceptive practice. So the FTC goes after companies that say they do one thing and do something different. So that's a fraudulent or deceptive so practice. Criminal, 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 criminal. Um, okay. Maybe, uh, okay. yeah. Um, it, it's usually going to be something dealt with by the Federal Trade Commission or a state attorney general. Other questions? I, I want some of the women in the room to raise their hands. <laughs> All right, in the back. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, wondering about the earlier research that you were doing on privacy policy and the one where you were uh, creating like an uh, image to help people determine um, whether the policy was weak or strong. Um, in that research, how did you actually determine the strength of the policy? I, I missed that part of the topic. Yeah, we, we actually, my students actually read a lot of privacy policies and analyzed them. And we had a set of criteria, and so we gave them points according to a fixed set of criteria and put, put them on the meter based on those points. Okay. Yeah. It was a manual process. If P3P actually existed and was adopted, then your computer would be able to read through all of the XML tags and do that automatically. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
one thing I really like about uh, about you is that I, my understanding is that you you are able to achieve a, a good work life balance. And from previous conversations or maybe a Facebook post, um, I know you you have a strategy, and I think it might be helpful just a one or two minute version if you have the time. Tell people that to demonstrate to people and show that no, you don't actually have to sacrifice your life and family to, to do what you do. Thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, as, as I've told Apu and, and others, I have this point system. Um, so I get a lot of invitations to speak places and to travel. And if I accepted all of them, I would be traveling constantly. And so um, uh, there was one year that I was actually traveling a lot. And my husband said, you travel too much. It's terrible. Stay at home more. And um, and I was like, no, I'm not really traveling that much. And he's like, yeah, yes, you are. You know, um, and so we went and looked at my calendar. And um, and what I came up with was, all right, let me um, give myself a travel budget, not in money, but in time. And um, and the point system, so it turns out, you know, it, it was I said, well, I can limit myself to N days a year. And he's like, well, the problem is that a weekend day hurts me a lot more than a weekday day, because I have to, like, drive the kids around all weekend, right? Um, and so uh, we came up with a point system where there's there's you know, like triple points on weekends and um, there, there's, a, there's a bunch of, of different subtle trade-offs that make sense in my family and probably wouldn't make sense for you. Um, but, but we agreed on these are the ways of assigning points. And then um, we took a, a stretch of time where my husband said, I think this, you know, the, the amount of travel you did the last three months was fine. And we saw, okay, well, how many points did that add up to? And we said, okay, this is the point budget. Going forward, this rate of spending points is acceptable to my family. And now that I have the point system, when someone asks me to travel, I look at, all right, how many points is this going to cost me? How many points do I have left you know, for the year? And is it worth it? Um, and I can make that decision and I can tell people, no, I'm sorry, you know, I, I just, I can't do it. Knowing that, you know, that would, that would conflict with my point system and I'm not going to do it. So I, I recommend something like that uh, to you. And, and you can use it not just for travel if you have, you know, other things that, that take time that you want to be able to account for. Uh, I think it can work. So. Thanks for coming here. <laughs> 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 it was, I, you know, I'm in and out in 24 hours, so not very many points. <laughs> so um, I have three students uh, here who are working on international privacy issues, Sanchari, Jayanti, and Yasmin. And all of your work has been, except for with PK, which you didn't touch on, very U.S.-centric. So uh, the early work we did show that uh, Spanish as a first language, people use question marks instead of exclamation points. So if you would directing your answers to them, uh, if you have any comments about international comparison studies, I would appreciate it. Sure. Um, so uh, I've, I've done a couple. Um, I did the work with, uh, with PK, who is one of my Indian students. Um, uh, and I had um, Yang Wang, who is a Chinese uh, postdoc, now a professor at Syracuse. We, we did some work on privacy in China. And um, I also had a student who looked at translation of privacy policies into many, many languages. Um, but, but really, I've only dabbled in this area. Um, but I think it, that, it's, that it is important to recognize that there are cultural differences in many fields, and privacy um, is certainly one of them, where, where we do find cultural differences in what people expect and what people want, and also how to talk about things so they actually make sense to them. Um, so I do um, definitely encourage more work in this area. I think it's an important area. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I was really interested about your your talk being uh, put onto the Delta Airlines as a venue. Can you speak at all about how effective that was? Did you get any statistics about how many people like watch that? Um, so so uh, I gave this talk at CNU as part of TEDx CNU, um, and uh, so I didn't expect it to go anywhere. Um, the main TED conference picked it up and they put it on their website. And there I can see how many hits it got on their website, and it's well over a million, um, which is pretty cool. Um, but then the Delta Airlines thing, I have not been able to figure out how to get any statistics on how many people saw it. And the only, only reason I even know about it 
was that several of my friends saw it and took pictures of their seat backs and sent it to me. And um, I didn't even fly on Delta during the period that I was up there. So I did not actually see it myself. Um, so I can only speculate as to you know how many people saw it there. But, but I know that there's over a million people have seen it. And I, I also know that um, I, you know, now when I get speaking invitations, um, if it's not like a university where there are people that know me, often they're like, oh, I saw your TED talk and would you come talk? Like I went and talked at FedEx, had an internal like security day and they invited me to come speak at FedEx. And uh, I think it was largely due to have they have they saw somebody at FedEx saw that TED talk. Um, so you mentioned that you did a um, research on the um, privacy browser um, rating website based on how, how um, well they do on um, privacy. Um, when you conducted that research, did you receive any um, backlash from the industry? Like how and how do you want? Yeah, yeah. So we um, we definitely got some pushback um, from industry. Um, some on that study. We did another study where we looked at some of the industry's own. Um, privacy opt-out tools that they're like, we're great on privacy. We let you opt out of tracking. And we tested them and found that they were just terrible. Um, and they, uh, the, the, um, one of the ad industry organizations actually issued a press release to debunk our research, um, which, which I view kind of as a point of pride. Like We must have really gotten to them um, because, I mean, I know it's good research. And they, they, they could come up with nothing objective to say about it other than they don't know what they're doing or something like that. Um, so, so yes, um, the, the, there are people in the industry who don't like the fact that we're doing research on this. Um, but there are also people in the industry who I think have a lot of respect for this research and want to see this kind of research and, and see what they can do so that they can still have their business, which does involve collecting data, but do it in a more privacy-friendly way. Well, Lori, I want to respect your time for lunch. So on behalf of both uh, Marine Biggers and CWIT and myself at CHR, thank you so much for coming and giving this inaugural talk. I know you were joking about the question of what you should be talking about and everything, but this really was, from my perspective, perfect. So thank you, thank you so much.